The idea was to try and write an overview of 20th century science because one doesn't exist and there's no doubt that science was one of the most important developments of the 20th century with all kinds of impacts on the way we live and work. Uh, and what I want to do is get a sense of, of how the developments of science worked in, uh, in relation to the developments of, of other processes and developments in history. So, so science is something that doesn't exist all of it, all on its own, a uh, long way from everyday life. Uh, even though that's sometimes the impression we, we get, sometimes our, you know, our image of scientists as of you know, white-coated boffins working away on obscure problems. Now, I think that actually a lot of 20th century science makes sense when you consider it in relation to working worlds. Working worlds are, are, are the way that things like the maintenance of human health or the building of new... Uh, technological systems or the pursuit of war, well that throws up all kinds of problems that need solving and what science has been particularly effective at doing is solving those problems, not directly because the world is just too messy and complicated to solve directly. What science does is, is build models and uh, uh, simplified representations of, 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 of issues that need solving and on that they can th scientists can theorise and explore and and run experiments. And actually when you look at science in that way, what you can see is many of the uh, important developments of science in the 20th century relate back to the working world, so the worlds that we live in, the problems that um, our societies have. So science in 1900 was much smaller scale. Uh, there was a typical physics experiment would be the size of a, of a, of a desktop. Um, whereas by the mid 20th century, uh, uh, certainly by now, um, science can be at the scale of huge experiments. So one thing that's happened in the 20th century since 1900 has been the growth of the scale of science. Uh, and the different disciplines look different as well. So physics around 1900 was just coming across, just trying to make sense of, of some new kinds of Phenomena, for example, X-rays only just been discovered. Discovered in 1895. Radioactivity was a uh, a phenomenon that was still mysterious. Uh, Einstein's special relativity was still five years away. So physics around 1900 was at a, a time of change, and that's going to lead to many interesting things in the 20th century. Uh, biology, well, biology you have the rediscovery of, of Mendel's work and that launches a whole new interest in genetics and genetics is going to be a very important thing in the 20th century. That's also starting around 1900. Um, in psychology of people like Sigmund Freud working, um, in astronomy, well the, the astronomers around 1900 would say we live in probably one big static galaxy, stars, nebulae, but quite different from uh, the, the, the astronomy we have now. Um, astronomers then would just look at the sky using light, whereas now we can use x-rays, we can use radio waves, we can explore the universe in all kinds of different ways. And the picture of the universe we have also is so different. We have a, an, a, an extraordinary universe, even bigger than could possibly have been imagined, I think, uh, in uh, 1900, one which is expanding, one which is full of mysterious entities like uh, black holes, one that's got uh, even odder things we just don't understand like dark energy and dark matter. So, you know, astronomy is another science that has gone from something fairly uh, small scale with a definitely different picture of the universe to something which is uh, uh, um, uh, grander and bigger uh, and, 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 uh, and exciting. One, one of the things that this book allowed me to do is look for the big picture and ask, you know, what are the, what are the really important developments? What are the things that really drive science in the 20th century? And what, one thing that really surprised me was just how significant war was for the sciences in the 20th century. Now, I suppose we, we we all know things like the Manhattan Project and the atomic bomb, right, which are you know, big projects with big consequences for you know, the, the capacity to destroy cities and 
uh, and uh, and warfare in the 20th century. But one thing that surprised me was just how pervasive the influence of warfare, the preparation for war, was in the 20th century. And partly that was because uh, of during the Cold War in particular, the sciences couldn't be mobilised um, at a drop of a hat because wars could only last maybe a few minutes. So war, so science was put on a permanent war footing for you know, four decades at least um, and ha hasn't stopped being um, permanently mobilised either even after the end of the Cold War. And, and that meant that a huge amount of resources went into the sciences, um, vastly expanding the physical sciences, picking out certain problems which needed solving. Uh, generating new sciences as well, creating opportunities and issues and problems. And, and, and with that framework, you can actually s understand quite a lot of the development of science in the 20th century. I, I think morality and, and science is best explored by looking at concrete case studies. Um, so if you look at a figure like Fritz Haber, for example, Fritz Haber uh, was born to a Jewish family in Germany in the 19th century. He, um, his, his work all throughout his career is, is the work of a German patriot. He wants to turn his chemistry to something that helps the German state. So that's what he's doing when he's, um, when he's developing uh, the Haber-Bosch process in connection with, with the industrialists. Um, to, and which allows the production of nitrates, fixing nitrogen from air, solving a world problem in the end. You know, two billion people are, by one estimate, fed during the 20th century because of um, the application of the, being able to manufacture nitrates. But he's also the figure who develops um, chemical weapons for the, um, uh, uh, for, the for, for Germany during the First World War. Um, and he does so enthusiastically. Uh, it's the application, you know, the morals there. Well, you know, it, it's framed through um, a vision of, of 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 patriotism, really, with devastating consequences. And quite often, we find um, we find the sciences being applied um, with with all often awful results. So whether we're talking about chemical weapons or we're talking about the devastation of the atomic bomb, because it's a it, partly it's technical, the reaction, for example, to the, the atomic bomb to, by many atomic scientists was, hey, it works. You know, we've, we've done it. It's, you know, we, 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 we were technically right, right? But what is missing from that is, is some of the ethical problem, issues and questions which come later. And it's partly it's the way that science is compartmentalised. You know, you can think just in a box and think it's a technical problem, when in fact it's a it's a contribution to a weapon of war with with, with terrible consequences. But also partly because they 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 know what they're doing, and it's it's justifiable because it's it's for example a con contribution to um, a patriotic cause. Um, so there's many reasons. Um, but they're best seen by understanding why people, why people applied science and worked on science in particular instances.